Hi friends, do you remember this device with the price of G-Wagon? Today there will be a video with the diagnostics and repair of this monster, though there will also be a third part. At this stage the repair isn't fully completed. I strongly recommend watching the first part of the video where I told the whole story and explained what parts the device consists of. Link is in the description. Another video will be released on this channel with finished results and verification. That is, this video is the first part of a long repair. The repair was agreed with the owner, but without guarantees for two reasons. The spare parts were brought to me by the owner himself and I am not completely sure of their authenticity. And the device itself has design flaws. And as it turned out later, the supplier himself did minor repairs before shipment. Some capacitor exploded and I subsequently discovered traces of this particular repair. For those who don't know, this is a powerful industrial induction furnace or high-frequency device for hardening large-sized metal products. The power is as much as 160 kilowatts. The power supply is 3-phase 3 380 volts. This induction heating unit includes a power inverter or generator and there is also a unit with a transformer and a resonant capacitor. The owner wanted every unit to be carefully checked and questionable components replaced. Let's start diagnostics and subsequent repairs. First, I note that all the nodes that I took out for testings were previously cleaned and, if necessary, washed in an ultrasonic bath and dried on a thermal table at a temperature of 50 degrees Celsius. A good diagnostics required the right approach. In our case, the task is to fully check all the nodes. The test and subsequent repair will be at the component level. This is difficult and time-consuming, but necessary. Now I want to tell about our sponsor, GLCPCB, which is producing printed circuit boards of any size, shape and layers. The company also offers services for industrial 3D printing, the creation of soldering stencils for soldering SMD components and the assembly of circuits. The link to the company's website you can find in the description. In a nutshell, I will explain what nodes it consists of and how it works in general. The three-phase 380 voltage is rectified and through current limiting resistors charges a huge bank of capacitors. In parallel, from the input, power goes directly to low-power transformers. There are five of them. Four of them are the same and feed the drivers of the power control modules. The middle transformer forms several power supply lines for control systems. In general, immediately after switching on, the power from the transformers is distributed to all nodes. It also goes to this small board. All this time capacitors are charged with a limited current. On this board is assembled a timer on a 555 micro circuit. After 10 seconds the timer will work, turning on this relay, which in turn switches the power supply to the winding of a powerful starter. As a result, now all the currents from the bridge goes through the closed contacts of the starter. The board on the front panel makes monitoring from all sensors. There are at least four thermal sensors, a current sensor, a water pressure sensor, power voltage monitoring, phase control, and so on. This board also controls the alarm indicator LEDs. In addition, in case of problems, this board stops the operation of the control board and the unit turns off. Another board with a bunch of 2 watt resistors is a load for the current transformer, which as far as I understand performs a dual role. It monitors the output current of the inverter and is a part of phase locked loop. There are 8 drivers, each of them controls its own transistor. There are 4 modules in total, there are half bridge and IA the number of transistors is 8. Now about diagnostics. I started by checking everything on the front panel, checked all the switches and emergency lights. The lights are actually LEDs, which with diode rectifiers are hidden under the light filters. Everything on the front panel is correct. Next, we move inside and start from the input. Here we have a powerful 3-phase Larinov bridge for 300 amps, 1600 volts. Of course, I checked the drop on each diode and saw slight but still spread 
so I decided to check it under load. I took out this bridge and tested it on currents of 40 amps. Me assured the voltage drop across each diode, it was about 0.82 volts. Bridge is fine. This operation was worth carrying out, because the bridge has been repeatedly under current heat. I didn't completely remove original thermal paste, but simply updated it using KPT8. Then comes the three-phase starter. All his contacts are connected in parallel and work like a powerful button. A snubber chain is handicraftly fixed on the coil. The coil is intact, the resistance is normal, the starter itself also closes. Behind the scenes the state of the contacts was studied. I'll say that it will serve a long time. Then there is a dual circuit breaker. The checking showed that the node is safe and sound. This isn't surprising, judging by the thin wires from it, there have never been large currents here. Next we go down to the boards. Let's get this board for a start. It provides a turn on delay, built on the basis of the 555 timer. There is also a 12 volt stabilizer. Resistors that smoothly charge the battery at the moment of switching on are also intact. Then after about 10 seconds the timer sends a signal to this relay which in turn supplies power to the starter coil and the latter works. Now, all current to the capacitor bank and the subsequent circuit goes through the closed contacts of the starter. This node is working properly. I don't even understand why I copied both the board and the circuit. The stabilizer on the board is also checked. There are no problems, but there are some questions. The 555 timer controls the relay directly without any transistors. I would still put the transistor to control the relay. And then we have a board, which is on the front panel. This board provides monitoring of data from all sensors and also illuminates a certain alarm LED on the front panel. Using the multimeter, I made the pinout of this board. It is painfully simple despite the large number of sensors. 4 or 5 thermal sensors, a water pressure sensor, phase control, current and over voltage control. This board has only one dual operational amplifier, LM358. But due to the additional, so to speak, transistor logic, two OPAMP channels are enough to monitor information from the bunch of sensors. On this board, all power lines and semiconductors were tested. The OPAMP here works as a comparator. I just measured the voltage of the outputs and compared with what comes to the inputs, and based on this it became clear that the comparator is working correctly. I returned the board to its place, it will be checked again already in operation, but without feed of powerful supply. Next, I took out the IGBT modules, by the way, each module has an individual temperature control in the form of a temperature sensor attached to the water cooling tanks. And I also checked the temperature sensors. The gate circuit boards, as already indicated in the first video, are in bad condition. Because the modules here have been changed several times and changed not very carefully, some tracks were torn off, the metallization was damaged. On the reverse side, these boards were filled with a sealant at the factory. Past repairmen removed the sealant from some of them. I removed everything that was left, washed, cleaned and processed to diagnose these boards, checked all resistors and protective zener diodes. The circuit of these boards is now in front of you. One of the boards the zener diodes had a slightly lower voltage and looked like they were exposed to heat. I preferred not to risk it and replaced all four pieces. Then I prepared boards for restoring the torn tracks, and then covered them with a triple layer of protective varnish on the reverse side and set them aside. We will return to them later, because during the experiments it turned out that the installed 4.7 ohm gate resistors are a bit too much for the modules that I will install. Drivers are perhaps the most time-consuming node for diagnostics, because there are 8 drivers here and each needs to be checked in different modes, under different loads and currents and with simulated gate capacitance. Next, oscillograms are taken with the measurement time of rise and fall and pulse amplitude. 
Then the correct operation of the driver is checked, for example if the control signal or feedback disappears. In case of any accidents, the driver must output a negative signal at the output, thereby reliably closing to transistor switches. If by chance they appear a high level, the switches will fail. All eight drivers were checked and then all obtained values were compared. In order to start these drivers, you need to generate three voltages, plus 15 for unlocking the switch, negative 12 for locking and a TTL level signal for control optics. Still need a weak PWM signal. Or it is possible without 5 volts, but with a PWM of a sufficiently large amplitude from 8 volts. The output of the driver must be loaded with a capacitor of a certain capacity, which is selected based on the capacitance of the gates of the selected modules, plus a non-inductive gate limiting resistor. Then I started loading all the drivers by current. The light bulb served as the load. Each of the drivers went through a series of tests for at least 1 to 2 hours. All protections were checked. Here we have saturation voltage monitoring of switches, gate under voltage protection, an alarm output that communicates with the control system via optics reporting problems. All of this has been tested for each driver. Next, I began to select a gate resistor starting with 4.7 ohms, which were originally here. But now the modules will be more powerful and heavier than original ones, so gate resistors needed with less resistance. They are selected so as to obtain the minimum possible rise and fall time of the pulse, and also so that the driver provides the maximum control current, that is there are no noticeable drawdowns in the control voltage at the desired maximum output current. As a result I stopped on 3.3 ohm gate resistors with very beautiful sharp pulses that suit in terms of time characteristics. One of the drivers was repaired using a component that isn't recommended for these modules. In addition, the repairman covered the driver pins with sealant. I think this is an ordinary sealant from a construction store, but for our case such a sealant cannot be used, because almost all conventional sealants are acid-based. As a result, I changed the microassembly and put the board in order. Plus 15 and minus 12 volt stabilizers were normal. I just renew solder and that's all. All 8 drivers have been serviced and tested. As for the drivers, I will note one more thing. The manufacturer recommends using such drivers with modules of no more than 400 amps if they have a collector emitter voltage of 1200 volts. But my modules are more powerful, they are for 450 amps and have a heavier gate than the original ones, which were for 300 amps. I recommended the owner to change the modules and take 350 amps so that the driver will get the margin and work easier. Of course the drivers could manage 450 amps modules, but will work at the limit of capabilities, so I suggested changing. Now new modules are being ordered. But the owner wanted to install those that are, for a while so that work in the workshop would not stop. As new ones come, we will replace them. In data sheet for these drivers, there is a circuit with an additional repeater at the output. This makes it possible to increase the maximum driver current, thereby pumping the switches at least a thousand amperes. This is a simple emitter follower on a complementary pairs. And the most interesting thing is that there are seats for them on the driver boards. Someone will write, why buy expensive modules if you can leave those that have already been bought and just add 10 amps transistors for current amplification and calmly control the modules. There will be 16 transistors in total and it costs a penny compared to expensive modules. Such a moment, the device is too expensive, such a refinement is appropriate. But if sometime the power modules fail, the owner will probably have the idea that this refinement could be the reason for that. I repeat that the owner is a cool guy, but I don't want to have the slightest doubt, so I decided to leave it like that and change the modules. If I did all this for myself at my own danger and risk, naturally it's a trifling matter, 
and I would add a repeater and that's all. But here I am responsible for someone else's property, so I put the drivers in place as they are. Next is a power capacitor bank to smooth out power ripples. It assembled on banks of 400 volts, 560 microfarads. The total voltage of the bank is 800 volts. The electrolytes are shunted with film capacitors. There are a bunch of discharge balancing resistors. The capacitance was measured and it amounted to an impressive 17,000 microfarads. The internal resistance is quite low and is a bit more than 4 milliohms. No visual damage was found, all capacitors are normal, it can be said with 99% probability that the bank is in order. In the first video I pointed out that not everything is good with the insulation. The power buses, which are under high tension, are in contact with the sharp edges of the holes in the housing and their insulation has suffered. I solved this problem with rubber insulators from junction boxes. In addition, these insulators are glued to the housing. In all the holes through which the wires go, there is already reliable insulation. The input part is also isolated, where phases were pressed against the metal housing. Power switches. Let's start, perhaps with the damper capacitors that were on the power outputs of these switches. This is a high voltage bank of capacity about 30 microfarads. All four banks are fully functional. Well, now power transistors. Initially they were Chinese star power modules for 300 amps 1200 volts, half bridge. The owner brought me 450 amp 1200 volt Infineon. They were bought on eBay and assured that they are original, so I'll put it at the owner's own risk. Of course some of their characteristics and operation were checked, as well as all sizes and their compliance with technical documentation. These modules were quite expensive and were bought from reliable sellers. I recommended the owner to install weaker modules for 350 amps. As a result the necessary modules will be ordered, but so that the work doesn't stop we will install Infineons. This is the decision of the owner taking into account all the risks. In terms of their speed characteristics they are slower than the factory ones. In terms of current, collector emitter voltage and saturation voltage, they significantly exceed the initial version. Naturally, they have a heavier gate. The driver will have a hard time. Everything is ready for installation, except that the local traders did not have normal 2 watt 3.3 ohm resistors for gates. They are cheap Chinese ones, but I won't install them. The normal ones have already been ordered and will receive in 1 to 2 days, and then I'll install modules. Do you think this is all? No, we haven't yet examined and diagnosed the control board, but this is a completely different story. In the third part of the video on this channel, I hope that the device will be completely ready. Please rate and comment on the video, all the necessary links as always are in the description. Now I say goodbye until we meet again, with you as always was Cassian TV.